Comfortably zoned with the Zigzag Man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with the Zigzag Man at Alameda, California's finest studio. 420 down by the lagoon where it smells just a little bit like rancid water in a man-made place but um that's the way it goes first your money then you close and um i'm glad you're here i'm glad you're listening topic for the day with our first guest is um failure to indict my guest is Brother Scott, who's been with the show from the onset and um, comes in and provides a, uh, a rational um, point of view as to what the heck is going on. And I'm going to let uh, Scott talk about Ferguson a little bit. And uh, here he is, Brother Scott. Hey, thanks, Ralph. Listen, you don't have to wax my ass to get me to pay for the coffee. I'll buy the cup of coffee. I'm just a guy with an opinion and a cup of coffee. And today we're talking about the failure of the grand jury in Missouri to indict. Okay, Scott's a retired attorney, so he does have an idea of uh, the law, and uh, he's not a ranter like yours truly. So there you go. Um. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's no. why you got to retire. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, no, the, a lot of people are quite disappointed. There's a sharp divide of opinion, but there's a substantial number of people who are quite disappointed in the failure of the grand jury in Missouri to bring an indictment against the police officer, Darren Wilson, with the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department. Uh, the failure to bring an indictment against uh, Officer Wilson in the shooting of Michael Brown, an unarmed teenager from the town of Ferguson. And um, unless you've been living in a cave, you've probably heard quite a bit about it. Uh, the reason I think a lot of people are so disappointed by the failure to indict is because uh, the case strikes at an underlying feeling that millions of us experience and uh, a feeling that arises in us at times like this, that there's something fundamentally wrong with what's going on here. There's something not right with this picture. And in the case of this indictment or failure to indict, what uh, a lot of people would benefit from knowing is that the uh, grand jury system as originally conceived, if I recall correctly, uh, from school days, uh, as originally conceived, the grand jury system was uh, ostensibly uh, designed and created to provide a bulwark against repression from the legal arm of the state. The king's government uh, and governments that came afterwards in England and the old world could not uh, bring a charge of a criminal nature against somebody without taking the case before the grand jury and getting their permission to bring that kind of a charge. And that sounds like a pretty good thing, and maybe in its time it was. But today it's morphed into another tool in the hands of the office of the prosecutor to bring a case even if he doesn't have much faith in the case. Sometimes that becomes necessary in the minds of the prosecutor. And uh, it's not hard to uh, conceive of how that might come about. We're looking at a case like that right now. A police officer works hand-in-hand -hand with the prosecutor, and they both work in many ways hand-in-hand -hand with the judge in a courtroom setting. And their whole aim is to bring a conviction. I mean, that's the number one goal, is to get the criminals off the streets. And so they want to bring the conviction. They operate on the uh, basis whether they're conscious of it or not, 
the record is clear. They operate on the basis of uh, whenever a crime is committed and somebody should be hung for it, best to hang wrong man than no man. So they will go after you if they want to, and the prosecutor can bring the, the case in front of a grand jury and be assured of an indictment. It almost always happens. I wanted to say 99 out of 100 times, but it's really much tighter odds than that. It's 99.9 .9 out of 100 times a prosecutor can get an indictment brought if that's what he's in, uh, intending to do. And it's been said uh, with a lot of laughter because many a truth is said in jest that a decent prosecutor could indict a pastrami sandwich if that's what he was intending to do. Uh, no matter what the nature of the case, because, at least in part, a grand jury proceeding is not like a jury uh, of your peers, a trial in front of a jury of your peers. That's not what its purpose is. It only requires a much lower level of proof to justify an indictment because all you're doing is charging somebody. You're not convicting anyone, and you're not sentencing anyone. You're just pursuing a charge, and you're unleashing the police forces of the state on somebody to bring that charge, to bring that indictment, and to get that conviction. So a prosecutor can summon a grand jury made up a jury made up of uh, a jury of his peers, not your peers, but the prosecutor's of, peers of the law enforcement establishment's peers, yeah. and citizens that might, in other respects, be considered pillars of the community. But in most respects. Uh, work as a tool on behalf of a prosecutor who asks for an indictment. And the prosecutor can operate under a very loose set of rules uh, as regards how those rules might limit his uh, conduct. With that in mind, uh, what went wrong in Ferguson, I, I guess the prosecutor did not want to bring charges. And what happened at that point? Well, I'm going to be precise as I can conceivably be. Um, in my limited mental abilities. I believe that any prosecutor worth his salt who wants to secure an indictment won't have much trouble doing it considering how grand juries are selected, who sits on grand juries, what type of people, uh, who's attracted to it, who's screened out from the process, who's finally the sitting grand jury. Uh, I would want uh, the listener to know that in order to get an indictment, you do not need a unanimous verdict from a grand jury. Um, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it is seldom, if ever, a unanimous jury verdict that is required before a prosecutor can secure an indictment. As a, it's a much lower standard than that and easier for a prosecutor to meet. I would also remind the listeners that people suspected of crimes um, and who are the targets of grand jury proceedings where an indictment is sought do not have the right to bring an attorney do not have the right to answer with advice of counsel. Um, and do, do not have the right to take the fifth? Of course they do. They have the right to take the fifth. And even though there's an instruction that says you can't hold that against someone, it's very hard to overcome the, the prejudice uh, that most people are raised with, that if you keep quiet, it's because you've got something to hide. Right. So, and that's not always the case at all. Uh, well, long and short of it is, the grand jury indictment was not going to be hard to get if that's what was uh, seriously intended. Now, someone on the other side, on the prosecution side of the bench might say, hey, you can't read my mind, you can't put words in my mouth, you don't know my thoughts. I didn't have anything like that in mind. I had my own reasons, and they're good ones, and, and for I'd like to hear them, but I haven't. Um, I've heard some artful weaving and dodging when the uh, prosecutor said he was going to be sure that this grand jury weighed all of the evidence and then brought its decision to him. Uh, and when in reality, in many grand jury proceedings, you don't hear all of the evidence. You hear the evidence that the prosecutor hand-selects to, to justify seeking an indictment, the evidence that makes the suspect or defendant look bad, look guilty. That's what he brings, and that's how he secures an indictment. If he's not really interested in an indictment, then he does what this prosecutor went on nationwide TV and said he had done in the interest of fairness. He said he let the grand jury hear all of the evidence. 
meaning the police officer's side of the story and the story of the police officer's supporters. And you can't get the dead kid's side of the story. In, in a sense, whether uh, by design or just in fact, it doesn't much matter for the eventual outcome. Uh, in a sense, the, the way the case was brought and the rules that are applied in the context of, of all of that, those realities, uh, the prosecutor did not vigorously seek an indictment. Um, he would have gotten a very poor grade in law school for bringing that kind of case in that kind of way before that kind of body. Would have it been good, a good move to bring the attorney general in, Obama come down and go, whoa, this sucks, this can't be happening. Um, let's, have, let's have the um, feds kind of investigate and see what's going on. Well, good question. You'll notice that, as might have been expected, the right reverends Al Sharpton and others. Jesse Jackson, I think, was there. I, I didn't see him. Maybe he was there. The point is... Maybe his $3,000 suit was that he just sent the suit ahead and didn't bother to show up. Or, hey, 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 what's a brother going to do to get a break? Let him uh, wear a $3,000 suit. <laughs> That's not the worst of his crimes. Well, The point is... What they seek and what they generally obtain uh, lately is a diversion of attention and frustration and disappointment and bitterness and rage, all righteous emotions, considering what's been going on. Divert those energies and feelings into the channel of voter registration drives and of federal investigations and a further process further proceedings. Uh, let's wait till the investigation is over. And then when that doesn't look like it's going well, the cry goes out, let's wait until the process runs its course. And the process takes so damn long and is oftentimes like we're seeing right now before our very eyes designed not to furnish a just result at all. Uh, that's not very productive. That's not a very noble or worthy aim. That's a, that's a recipe for disinterest and demoralization because people go through that ringer over and over and over and over again. Every generation has to learn it anew. And, uh, and the disappointments mount. And the number of victories by going through the process are uh, very easy to count. And the number of defeats vastly outnumber them, and it's not a very productive process. But it does serve to pour water on the gunpowder and make sure that nothing gets out of hand. Yeah, so we're being placated one way or the other. I, I believe that. I believe that uh, there's an iron fist and there's a velvet glove. And the iron fist is the police, the courts, the cops, the judges, the jails. That's the iron fist. And the, and the velvet glove is the Reverend Al and those types of people. And they uh, divert attention away and dissipate the energy and don't focus it where it needs to be focused, if I may be so bold. Well, you may. Hey, that explains it, my man. Thank you. Um, short, concise, and to the point, is, um, as always, thanks a lot for being here, Scott. Thanks for having me. All right. As usual, I will end the segment by imploring Scott and everybody out there to keep your dreams wet and your humor dry. Keep your kids out of recruiting stations, military recruiting stations. Bob, for the whole family. You know what I mean, Gene? And most importantly, keep on keeping on. I am back, and as usual, you are comfortably zoned with me, the zigzag man in Alameda, California, down by the lagoon, and whenever I say lagoon, I always uh, lapse into my Archie Bunker there. Uh, Archie was from Jackson Heights, New York, growing up, went to Newtown High School as did I. Don't you know that, eat it. So welcome back. Um, I'm thrilled to have a, um, 
a Renaissance man on a, um, a comedian, an author, a surfer, and a cancer survivor. And uh, ironically, the book is about the experience that uh, Fred Reese, my guest. How are you doing, Fred? Good, good. Ralph, how are you doing today? All right. Um, Fred had an experience that uh, he would not wish on anyone, and he what? got through it uh, with dignity, an overwhelming amount of dignity, and, uh, and poise. And that's all one can ask in life. Um, I knew Fred when I started doing comedy. We worked together in um, in the late 80s, the early 90s. And uh, Fred, who wrote this tremendous book, uh, you want to tell us about it, Fred? Uh, today, cancer, tomorrow, the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was a, uh, uh, you know, because you can get it on Amazon. I have a, it just so people know. I'm not trying to push it to uh, make money off people that are ill. Oh no! The name of the the name of this show is um, constant uh, self gratification, self um, plug yourself, man. That's what it's about. Okay, well, if it's, if it's constant self gratification, I'd be doing something else while we're talking. But uh, you're not that attractive. Um, All right. You... But, uh, but uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, is just that just so people know, I mean, I have a I have it's a book is today cancer tomorrow the world, but I have it as a ninety nine cent e book as well. Uh, and my theory is you can buy the book uh, through me uh, at my website or, or through Amazon and help me out. But if you're struggling and you're broke and you need to help somebody who has cancer, it's a 99-cent e-book. They refuse to make money off people that are suffering and, and can't afford it because of uh, the health, health costs. Not to get noble, but it used to just piss me off when I was going through cancer. One is it's hard enough to read when you're going through chemo. But when you can read, and they have books on cancer, and these guys are charging twenty-five or thirty bucks for an e-book, and I'm going, why are you making me suffer even more? <laughs> you know, it's like you, you should be nice to people. You should give them a break. And uh, I, I refuse to, uh, you know, make money on that end. But uh, well, Fred, I've kept my... track of you, obviously, and you go back to the when you go back for periodic exams, you bring a fistful of books back for patients. Um, Let's give credit to, to uh, uh, Sanford University. Um, that's where you took your treatment, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, the Stanford, Stanford Cancer yeah. Center. It's kind of the Hilton with chemo. Uh, you know, they don't leave right. mint on your pillow. They leave a catheter. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a tough deal. You know, it's, it's funny. And all hospitals are saying the only department you understand that's in common English is called billing, you know. You know. You'll see infusion. You'll see a lot of other things, but uh, uh, you know, I'm, you know I just, uh, I just felt for you every day when you were going through it, um, and I feel for for the experience that you had. Uh, how do you help other people? I know humor is such a big, of course, is such a big part of your life. The book takes a, a semi-humorous look at it all, doesn't it? it, it you don't take it too seriously. Take yourself too seriously. Am I ex am I explaining that well, properly? Uh, that's that's yeah. That's, that's some of it. You know, you have to. Uh, largely, the thing is, some people say, "Hey, how can you have a sense of humor over cancer?" I mean, because you know, you know, I'm from New Jersey, and uh, you know, when I was first diagnosed, they gave me a month to live, and that was not because of cancer. That was based on my personality. You know, <laughs> so, uh, so you were the most. Uh, you used to be what they call an insult comedian and you were the least it was the least character you know if you go well um i understand that guy's an insult comedian it's uh but you were just not an insulting guy you were you even wrote a book about insults that weren't insulting they were funny but they weren't insulting i don't think you have an insulting bone in your body uh, Am I surf with me? <laughs> the, I, you know, but uh, no, I think that's well, what you say is is kind of true. Well, one thing I learned when I was doing stand up early, uh, and I was doing the insult stuff, I was just kind of uh, shaking it out and developing the act. And I made some crack about the Special Olympics to some guy. And after the show, uh, a, a guy in the audience said to me, "You know, Fred, I thought you're pretty funny. You know, but 
don't pick on, you know, people that are retarded. They can't help it. And that stuck with me um, because, you know, you can insult people about their hair or their weight. You know, they could change those things. But you shouldn't insult somebody about what they can't change. That's cruel. And and sometimes, like I said, that's a good ex, uh, explanation on criticism, too, because it's constructive. It doesn't say you suck. It doesn't say you're great. You can't do anything with those two points. But when somebody gives you something constructive like that, you go, you know what, I can learn from this or just be an idiot. And uh, I kind of went with uh, the learning part of it, which is always a little humble. It means you have to be cleverer, <laughs> harder. Right. <laughs> I like right. that. I kind of go easy. But, but none of my insults were ever racist. You know, I never – uh, I was kind of always different than uh, Rickles, uh, and there's nothing wrong with his style and his generation style. He can get away with it because it does, he doesn't really mean it, obviously. Uh, but today there's such a uh, detector out there of sensibility that you're only – if you're of that race, you can do it. But if you're a white guy, forget it. You're only going to ruin your, ruin your career. Um, right. But I never, I, never, I never went there anyway. You know, it never, never interested me to go in that direction. But it is interesting to me. It is interesting to me that black comedians can do whitey, and it really is funny, and it's okay. Yeah, it's it's, it's a double standard, and it's just how, how largely you know women can knock men and say you know talk about their genitalia and make fun of them and their sexual performance, and uh, you know and and but guys when they get that way they're called misogynistic and but you know it still comes down to if you have a certain style you can kind of get away with certain things uh and everyone has to find their style uh but uh for the large most part you're you're very true on that and uh, i think it's a cop-out because when you're doing stuff like that for other whether you're black white asian whatever you're playing the race card uh you're just playing it on yourself and and you know if you want to make a living that way you got to live with the consequences of it. you're perpetuating the stereotype that doesn't help anybody because right. you're playing because if, if a guy from the ku klux klan could laugh at you and your racial stereotype about your Asian mother, or you know how how black people act, or whatever. Then you, it, it, you get what you deserve there. You know, uh, I wouldn't want one of those guys to say I was funny. Uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, hey, you got to go with it. Well, part uh, of that so comes well, from just getting older. We're talking about 25 years ago now when uh, when we worked together. So part of it is getting older and just experiencing life, and. Um, Sam Levinson wrote a book years ago called um, uh, Humor is the, uh, Laughter is the Best Medicine when I was a kid. And, um, that I was think before HMOs. It, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, uh, right. <laughs> it, uh, uh, there's no such thing of the two. It's an oxymoron, laughter and HMO. No, no, no. Um, wow. <laughs> what we've gone through in our society. How did you pay for all this? Did you have, were you blessed with a good insurance policy? Uh, well, the, the, I, uh, there are a couple of ways there. Again, I'm, uh, I'm Fred Reese. Well, family, mo- family money, all the better? <laughs> no, well, mm-hmm. no, it's, you know, some of the money I had. And, uh, you know, it, uh, when, well, what happens is you, uh, I, had a, I, had a, I had insurance. But the, the drama right. with insurance is, and, and most people, even if you pay for your insurance, because I'm a two-time cancer survivor, so I was always big on carrying my insurance. Um, and my costs probably were up to, I guess, between 75000 to 100000 which is almost cheap considering what I hear other people have to pay. Um, and and uh, that didn't even come with fries. Um, it was, I mean, it cost, like, I spent one night in the hospital, and it cost $1,200, and that was just for overnight parking. You know? uh, <laughs> so, so, but, but, but the thing is, uh, this is what they do. And the hospital, clear, I've talked to guys in Billing, and I've talked to guys in Stanford, and they told me this. Uh, the, the hospital, let's say you have a $1,000 or $5,000 deductible, and then beyond that you pay 10%. Okay, well, the hospital jacks up their costs uh, to get more money from the insurance company, and the insurance company bargains with them back and forth to reduce the cost that they've jacked up. So hypothetically, let's say they jack up a cost of a $5,000 service to uh, 20000 and the insurance company knocks it down to ten. Well, 10% of your deductible is 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 a thousand bucks. Well, if if let's say your your treatment is a hundred thousand, that puts it at ten thousand. Uh, Jesus know, so Christ! That's so, so unbelievable. They're negotiating 
for right. the patient's money, a, pa- a right. part of the patient's money. They're going to get money. It's just a matter of how much they get and how much more they can get from the patient. It, it's right. deplorable. It's a deplorable sis- system. I mean, uh, what can be done to... can't help it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking out loud, what can be done to reform this? Well, it, you know, the steps have been taken in some respect. I mean, uh, it, it's annoying. I mean, I travel to Australia, and Australia has cradled a great coverage. And believe it or not, that's not called socialism. That's called taking care of your people. And because of that, when you think about it, you're free to kind of look for any job you want because you're not hooked in to having to keep it, stay at one job for the benefits. You can actually meet your right. life and travel, surprise, and maybe get to know other people and not have, uh, you know, this polarity we have in our country, which is largely because they're not traveling around and talking to each other more than we should talk to. I mean, look at how can you stay Democrat or Republican when you're dealing with health care? Don't they have uncles? Don't they have aunts? Don't they have sisters and brothers? And when I listen to these guys that talk and they say the phrase Obamacare and, and they're against health care and they say go to the emergency room where, of course, you can get treated for chemo. Yeah, right. But the thing is, is like if these guys think that the free enterprise system can provide health care cheaper than the government can and they're the ones getting government health care, I say to them, then you give up yours first and you show me what company you go to that's cheaper and, and less expensive than the one you have right now. And they can't do it. And they got us worried about all these other issues, and we forgot about our own blood and bone, talking to each other to get together with what we have in common, regardless of how you feel about gays getting married or how you feel about Nancy Pelosi or whatever friggin' button people hit. Let's stick to let's see, stick to flesh and bone and hold each other a little closer. I mean, I'm not a preacher. I mean, I, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm from New Jersey. I have carpal tunnel damage in my middle finger. You know, I mean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that now, Fred, Fred, <laughs> very, very funny, That, um, especially to me. <laughs> yeah, I figured you got, you'd like that. Being a I do immensely, and um, I, I could never use it without giving you credit, but um, <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Fred. Uh, yeah. Lifetime of memory from that one. <laughs> <laughs> So I got to tell you, um, I was married to a woman from Bayonne, New Jersey. So um, it's just like I'm somewhat of an, a Jerseyite by extension. Um, it's a small like extension. In, Where'd you grow up? I grew up, I grew up in uh, Friel, New Jersey. You know, and uh, I would have to say it formed my character. You know, the world I came up from, and the world you came from. I'm not talking about the planet you came up from, but the, the world. Um, you know, we, we had, you know, no one, no one our age was out of work uh, in our parents' generation. Uh, right, absolutely. That came home. There was, uh, you know, work was done. There was no home office. No one bothered you. The women didn't have to work. They had driveways. They had houses, not townhouses or condos. They had a better life. And uh, they're trying to tell us that doesn't exist. Well, they took it away from us. So, and what's, what's funny is even our own generation took it away from us. Uh, so... But uh, it's, it's, it's a different world. And hey, I think the guy this is a different world. When you can use an expression like the working poor, hey, Same. fuck you. I'm working 40 hours a week. I can't support my family. And the CEO makes $50 billion a year. What The disparity is sickening. And people are going to fucking revolt. Uh, pure out. That's my thinking of it. Well, that's true. Um, well, 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 you, well, you talk to people, they don't vote. You know, they say, oh, it's a choice between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You say, well, Tweedledee was, was Al Gore and Tweedledum was George Bush. Do you think Tweedledee would have got us in, this, in the war that we've been in for 14 years, that we would have stepped in a bee's nest of the Mideast? Do you think that would have happened? Come on. You know, there is a difference between the parties. And, yeah, different people have different deals, but it's politics. You have to be vigilant and fight for yourself just like you have to fight for your own health care when you go in the hospital or whatever you do. You know, no one's going to – hey, even your father is not a good father figure. You know, I mean, you, you can't look for that. You know, sometimes Freud was wrong. I mean, just, just because you want a mother and father doesn't mean you hey, were your mother and father. Right, leave you in some barrel uh, with no clothes on when you're 18 days old, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I did climb out of that, though, you know, and I got better clothing as a result. Well, I made you a stronger person, Fred, and I think that's what pulls you through. It isn't anything else. Um, what did your dad do? What did your parents do when you grew up? Uh, my dad worked for Amer- uh, AMF, American Machine and Foundry. You remember Boyk, We Make Weekends, and the little triangle thing for bowling alleys? That was really big. 
Uh, they eventually got taken over in a hostile takeover by Erwin Jacobs, who broke up the company, made millions, and raided the pension plan, and uh, ruined a good company. Uh, left nothing in its place. But, but then again, see, the suits that were running the company uh, were willing to sell out to them. Uh, willing, and, and, you know, a lot of these guys in upper management, they act like they're big, important guys. But someone to get up there, they're, like my dad said, you know what, I, Fred, or he used to call me Fritz. He goes, Fritz, you know what I learned? Uh, they were just up there to steal. And, you know, so uh, they were looking for whatever they could, uh, order things for the company, artwork for their office, and then take the artwork home, stuff like that. And then they meet each other. A lot of these guys are in a circle. Uh, and, and you can see that now uh, in some respects. But, hey, they got to live with it. Um, but right. uh, yeah, how, did, how did his experience influence your life in terms of what you wanted to do? Did you go to working for some other co- some company and – you know, doing the 40-hour-a-week trip is just uh, not what you had in mind. I mean, something you had to cross the threshold to get to become a comedian, as all of us did. A lot of it is looking for an alternative way to go through, you know, go through the world, go around the track. Or as my friend David says, you don't go around the track, you go down the track, because the track doesn't return. But uh, well, David uh, I think that what happens is, and no matter who you are, uh, people will tell you who you you are, whether you want to know or not. And uh, and you could, in, in you know, you'd be, I'd be funny, and somebody go, "You miss your call, you missed your calling." And I go, "Oh, geez, I have an answering service, and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know." And, and so so, uh, and then then there comes a point. I mean, in my case, I'd have to say, I mean, I started doing comedy actually when I was like seventeen or eighteen. Uh, and going to clubs a little bit, uh, but oddly, um, I didn't. I, I stopped because the guys I admired were like guys like Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul. I mean, uh, and and wow, they had lives. They, they had lives, and I said, you know what? I mean, I really felt they didn't have a life. And and to to really talk to people that way, my my jokes were about monsters and they were good jokes, uh, but they were just about being a kid, uh, which which today would probably have been good. I was just misplaced. But at the same time, I, I, I don't want to sound like that's what I would have preferred. Um, I just, but then when I had cancer the first time at age 27, um, I thought, well, uh, I was laying in bed. I said, who will I be if I'm laying in this bed again, whether it's 30 years from now or next week? Who will I be? And I said, well, I would have to say, uh, since I'm looking at death right now and I had cancer the first time at 27, uh, I'd have to say I've had some kind of a life, and now I probably have something to say. I, I whatever it is, I, and I have to shape that. And uh, I decided, you know, then and there, that I was going to go to uh, California, and I was going to do stand up, and I was going to do writing, and I was going to surf and learn about wine. But the first vow was really just do stand up, and I started doing it in Connecticut, uh, at the Treehouse in Norwalk, Connecticut, uh, a nice, nice club still around, run by Brad Axelrod, a very nice guy as well. And which is unusual in club owners, as you well know. Um, yes, I will. But, uh, <laughs> but but it, it, that, that's where it started. And like anyone, you know, terrible and, and kept on pounding it. But I, I felt um, going to California and San Francisco was the way to go because uh, that was a great way and had a rep for developing your act. And that's what I it was. A me- it was a mecca at the time you came out. It was a mecca. For yeah, it was. Did it was. You, did you work at the Holy City Zoo at all? Do you have memories of that? I did on. Uh, I did on it in its second life, not its first life. Uh, too bad. Too bad. Okay. It was closed, and then Tom Sawyer picked it up. Uh, but it was it was past its zone as the zoo, so to speak. It still was the zoo, and you know I played it, and I'd say when that room was crowded and packed, it had the feel. I really did. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most I mean, time. because people were right on you. And it's where Robin got started. I I ran into um, to an issue with folks from the zoo when Robin passed away. There's a Holy City Zoo fan club thing on. And I made a posting that from the bottom of my heart that I thought committing suicide was a selfish act. I said that without right. just, I mean, all the people that he, you know, that miss him, his kids, this, that, the other thing. And I got an incredible amount of flack on that posting from folks who I know, have known, respect, like, some I dislike, you know, 
the gamut of people. And then I, I uh, how can you know, Robin this, Robin that. And then I Googled the thing, and I there's a question thing. This was before Robin got. The que- question was, how many people think that suicide is a selfish act? And 48% of the people, or it was either 46 or 48% of the people think or thought, yes, suicide is a selfish act. It's an opinion, for Christ's sake. It may not be the majority, but it was an opinion. I took a lot of heat from a lot of folks on that. And on some, and on some levels, um, I got to think about it. I don't know what he was suffering, this, that, and the other thing. You come to mind as much as you struggle to maintain life, that he has to be the antithesis of that. It just, um, you know, two comedians, two... Uh, your humor was different, um, uh, this, that, and the other thing. But um, you know what I'm saying? Can you can you react to that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Or is well, it... I would, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I'd have to say it never as as ill as I was, and I, I you know, with chemo and you know, shaved my head and and weak and uh, fatigued out and weighed down and aching in bones and and had sores lining my mouth, so many sores that when I tried to eat a banana during chemo, the seeds in the banana ripped the roof of my mouth open and made it bleed. That's how sensitive it was. Oh, and, but man. I looked at oh. everything I was going through, including chemo, as a healing process. And I I just, just and it was weird, you know, when you're uh, diagnosed. I remember the funny thing about being diagnosed was after I was diagnosed, I walked out in the hallway and in Stanford Cancer Center, they have a woman playing the harp. And, and I'm going, man, if there's ever an instrument you don't want to hear, I said, you know, a harp. You know, I said, what if, you know, it's like I, I have no intentions of buying a timeshare to that gated community just yet, you know. <laughs> and uh, But but then, you know, you walk up and uh, and you stand in front of the doors of infusion, you know, which is a fancy word for chemo. And I go, yeah. wow, look at this. If I don't go through these doors, I uh, uh, I will die. I will die. And, and some people think that, you know, chemo is being done to them. I think that's wrong. You have chosen to take chemo. You have chosen to fight the disease. These are things not being done to you. These are things you're doing to the disease in you. And I remember when I stood in front of there, actually early on, to step back just a little bit, uh, when I talk about this in Today, Cancer, Tomorrow, the World uh, book, um, is of all things I did is I, I rented the movie Rocky, the DVD, and the only reason I wanted to see it not was because not because Rocky won, but because there's that first scene where he throws the punch at Apollo Creed when Apollo Creed doesn't think Rocky can fight him, and that fight that punch comes out of nowhere early in the round, and and the, and, the, and the guys in his neighborhood in the bar cheer and the guy, and, the, and the guy's down and Rocky's above him, and the guy goes he thinks it's a real fight don't you get it. And the exhilaration and inspiration of that little moment, I, I, I treasured that. I said, you know, I have to be that first punch in Rocky every second of every day and every week and every month and every year of my life from now on. If I'm going to beat this disease, I've got to be that punch. And so, and I'm going to get back to the world of health, and I'm never going to lose that, you know. Uh, and so that's what I went for. I, I never thought of that that dark hallway, you know, where they, and, you know, the thing is, you know, they say, oh, you know, you go down, go down the hallway and you reach the tunnel and you go towards the light. I said, you know what? I don't want to end up back in New Jersey. I know what that tunnel leads to. <laughs> you know, it's like, and besides, you only have to walk through the, to the light if you live in darkness, right? Right. And so, uh, I, keep I, the I, light, I, keep the light with you. You don't have to walk to it. Right, exactly. And, and so the depression thing, you know, it's like people who take drugs because they're bored with themselves, you know, or they have an emptiness, a, a void they can't fill. And, and uh, you know, maybe because I was raised like that, uh, raised against that, I, I, didn't, I just didn't have that in me. I remember I, I did, when I was a kid, you know, you had these passion affairs and stuff. And I remember this woman, uh, you know, insecure lady that I dated one time, she just said to me, you know, you're a cork. No matter what I do to you, you just keep on popping up. And it's like, well, okay, I mean, that's just my nature. Um, but, but, I mean, I've seen people give up and I've seen people fight. Uh, but I do, I'm not a big fan of suicide. Um, I'm just not, I'm just not. I mean, unless you're ill and 
and you don't want to give all the money to the HMOs and end up connected to 55 uh, tubes, uh, fine. You know, take your own life. That's good. I mean, if you have to, there's no way out. I, you I have to, that. right. But you but, did, but, and, and I, di- you were, and didn't. No, I did not, you know. But, you and, know, I, and that's getting your point. You said the, well, getting back to what you, you said, where you get these people angry. See, the key thing with a suicide is you can say it's a cry for help no one heard in time. And so people could have lashed out at you just because they knew that they weren't there for that man or noticed it to stop it. And, and no, I, I, will say the, I will say this. No one was there for that man. And anybody, who, any of those people that take blame for not being there for the man are, are wrong in doing that. Now, um, I don't think that was it. I, I think it was just a case of hero worship. I mean, he was... He just he was robbing, and it was just this, that, and the other thing. And I don't think they were thinking rationally um, along those lines. But it wasn't it wasn't because, because he was superficial, and I don't think um, he could have reached out, which is what it would have taken. I don't think he would have given the signal to uh, um, for one reason or another. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't know the man, and you know he had. You know, he had people around him that he took care of. He was very kind. He did a lot of work for visiting kids in hospitals, and absolutely helped out a lot of yeah. comics, uh, uh, obviously along the way. Uh, but a lot of people had seen him, uh, and he had lost quite a bit of weight. And pe- everyone, people knew they noticed things about him. But uh, but I don't like I said I don't know the finer points there. I can't. But. I, I, well, I think there's some there's a little bit of truth too, and we're both kind of saying on that. Uh, but I don't know the entire deal. I mean, uh, either way, it was a great loss. You know, it, it's too bad. A that, great, you know, a great loss on so many different levels. Um, one of the most talented humans that ever walked the face of the earth, as was Bill Cosby, and I can't help um, that he comes to mind what he's going through. Uh, just a mind fuck of it all. I mean, um, just. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I didn't, I didn't, I'm glad he never gave me a roofie. I can tell you that. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know um, how to answer that, Fred. Um, are you glad because um, you just didn't want to break any hearts, or are you glad because you wanted to stay out of the paper? Or, uh, who knows? Hey, listen. Um, I just wanted to, before we go, you've taken the way you live your life out surfing with you. And I read about it when you're nice enough to post about it. Tell me, the, tell the story of this guy who cut you off the other day. I just paraphrase that a little bit and the way you handled it. And the way, it just tells me how you are and how, how super you are and you have a way I'm about. I remember right? which one you're talking about. You know, <laughs> do they cut honest. you off all the time? I mean, you, it was just well written. And um, what's it like out there? What's how is it? How is it a microcosm of life as uh, of the world? How's the surf well, world? Unfortunately, it's become it's become a microcosm of the world. Before it wasn't the world. Uh, you know, when I first started surfing, the guys I met out there were guys I could only meet in the ocean. Uh, and now they're the same people I can meet at Starbucks or Blockbuster or wherever the hell they are. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with those people, so to speak, but uh, they're, they're, they're different. They don't have a passion for the ocean. And so now because of uh, surfboards, these Costco boards that are only 99 bucks, uh, people kind of look at the ocean as a park that they can just come out there and do stuff with, but they don't want to learn about the etiquette and how to play. I said, you know, you just don't walk on a tennis court you know, with a racket when somebody's playing and step out there and just start playing because you feel like playing. Every every activity has some rules to it. But what it shows is that there are people that just believe in doing what they want to do and gratifying themselves when they can. And what's funny about it is in surfing, you can't hide that. You know, if you're going to snake a guy in a wave or steal a wave, it's all on the surface. So their life behavior is, is visible right in the water. They can't conceal it. And in life, like in the business world, you can hide behind office politics and people can't call you on your stuff. Or if you have money, you know, people have to kiss your ass because they're the waiter or somebody that serves you and you can kick them, which is what some people do because they can't answer back. 
they have to be professional. But in the water, when those people go out and they act that way, somebody could square off on them, and they can't handle it. They can't handle being called on themselves, and they lash out. Uh, so, you, you know, and sometimes you just look at them and you go, look, you know, there, there's etiquette, there's rules. And then and they'll mouth off to you and you go like, and you're saying everything, you know, I'm a beginner. It says, well, when are you going to begin to apologize? When are you going to begin to learn? When are you going to begin to say, I'm sorry, or I made a mistake? And then they'll, they'll turn it back on you. They'll just say something like, well, I guess, you know, you make the rules. It's your ocean. And, and you, don't, you didn't say that. But see, their, their whole argument is, Based, the design it based on getting what they want. They'll say, oh, we're out here to share. I says, well, then if you're going to share, why didn't you let me just enjoy the wave by myself? Why did you have to go in front of me? Sharing is giving something to somebody, not taking it from them as they're enjoying it. Uh, so they have, a, they, have a, they have a network of things that they say, and what's kind of funny is now all the idiots know each other better, and so they just try to outnumber you. Uh, and then, then you're the problem, you know. So, so, so it's it's it's. Uh, but still, the thing is, they're not cool, and they know it, and and it catches up on them. Uh, but that's that's kind of what's out there now, and and the uh, and that's kind of what, in, the bottom line is. Yeah. That, so it is a microcosm. It sounds like either Congress Congress. or the Senate or big business. You know, it's pretty well, much I, the same. Well, those, those guys make more money. <laughs> oh, right. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah, but but, the, but, but the, uh, uh, the, the kicker is, though, is when you're out like that, you don't, you don't meet people out in the water. You don't make real friends. Uh, those people usually show up by themselves and leave by themselves and have to form clubs and false groups. But, but if you're genuine, you will meet some really good people who will be there for you, and you will cultivate good friendships. So, and you'll also improve as a surfer because guys will tell you what you're doing wrong. If you're a jerk, no one tells you what you're doing wrong. And that's the one thing that all those guys have in common, the bad ones, is that their surfing never improves because no one tells them that they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, so, Fred, so, let, me, so, let, me go back a, let me go back a second for clarification. When you were in New Jersey and coming back out, coming out to California, when you said, man, I'm 27, I'm blah, 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 now I'm coming to California, and you're – you listed a few things. I want to do comedy. I want to do it and surf. How did you know about surf? You're from New Jersey. I mean, did you come out? No, South Jersey had surf. South Jersey had surf, and I'd have to say the the origin of it uh, or one of the. Oh, I did. I didn't know that. I honestly, yeah, I've been yeah. away for. Yeah, on the shore on Jersey Shore, the surf as well. Jersey Shore, yes. Yeah, even, even Springsteen had a shortboard, but I don't think he was that good a surfer. Fortunately, he wasn't. Otherwise, it wouldn't have turned out anything good. Uh, but uh, his best stuff is the early Jersey stuff for me. I mean, but I like his music. Anyway, that, that aside from that, I would have to say too, the obvious thing is, uh, you know, the Beach Boys and uh, and right. Endless Summer. Uh, those films, it's like there was something about that. And I also, I mean, I was like nine, and I had blonde hair and blue eyes, and I had a tan in the summer, and I always liked the beach. And I'm going, I I belong in California. Plus, you know, right. you got a surfer's kid. face, Fred. You got the jaw and everything going for you. So. Um, I'll take uh, it. You're a su- you're a super guy. You know you know what super guy is. <laughs> I, I do. I do. I do. All right. So and in the best of all, I say that in the best of all possible ways. I'm thrilled you were on. Um, I hope you'll come back from time to time and just let us know what's going on. I know you're getting up again doing stand up. Uh, tell me where you're going to be next. Uh, tell everybody out there where they can see you on your um, uh, on stage. Yeah, well right now it's just I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just getting back and uh, after you know I just have to uh, I have a lot of jokes I'm doing about cancer and uh, performing with that and uh, and it's just a whole other direction I'm, I have to take and um, you know just I'm, I'm just playing around with that right now so I don't uh, I don't have any any place to go right now except wherever somebody wants to see me because as, as you know in comedy the only way you can get better is under artificial light. And so I, right. you have to go to the stage and you have to throw that stuff out there, good or bad, and, and uh, throw it. And, you know, there's no excuse. You're jumping off a high dive and there's no water in the pool. And that's, that's <laughs> the essence of, of, of really if you want to do what you want to do, there are no half, half measures. And yeah, I, have an immense, half measure. I have an immense respect for anybody who could stand up on stage for any talent whatsoever, anything that they bring to the stage to get up. I mean, you t- I'm sure you take that same risk with guitar and with singing and with, you know, dancing and all that, that stuff. No, I, you, 
Yeah. Well, well, I might have might having some guys open for me. <laughs> so, terrible. I, oh, he's thinking it up. He's doing dirty jokes so they can't follow me. You know, it's like, get him off. He's wasting my life. You know? Right. That's what's funny about comedy. You're around it too much sometimes. You forget the laugh, really. It can happen. Absolutely. Hey, Fred, thanks again. I'm going to end the segment with the way I do every segment for Comfortably uh, Zone. Big answer tomorrow, the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You can do that, but let me just say that I want you and everybody out there to keep the dreams wet and their humor dry, keep your kids out of recruiting stations, military recruiting stations will change their lives, and not often for the better, one way or the other, and keep your kids off the laps of clerics wearing dresses. That's always a good thing for the whole family. Most importantly... Keep on keeping on, Fred Reese. Um, thank you. All right, man. See you next time. That work? Okay, thanks. I appreciate oh, the interest. Over and out, man. All right, take care of